Our final uh, formal speaker for today is Kevin Jones. Kevin Jones has been the uh, director of the South Australian um, Maritime Museum uh, for 15 years. He calls it his Millennium Project. Um, I've had the pleasure of working uh, with him for at least 10 of those years. Um, and uh, I suppose having grown up on wooden vessels and older wooden vessels, um, I can see the value of keeping uh, maritime heritage not only preserved but working. And I don't think it's a, a stretch to say that Kevin is probably one of the leaders in Australia and, and in other places in, in managing to achieve the delicate bal balancing act that is keeping heritage vessels on the water and doing it with a largely volunteer workforce. Um, so, Kevin, we're really delighted that you're coming to speak to us today. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks. our port. Um, some people talk about wanting a younger workforce, some people talk about an older workforce. We like old things. Um, this has nothing to do with our talk, it's just a beautiful picture and we, we look out the front and see a fairly empty landscape and I think how wonderful it once was. Guess what? Next, okay. Okay. Um, for those of you from interstate, the catches are the kind of signature craft of South Australia. We all have something that we think represents our waterways. Here it was the catches. Um, and now I'm on topic. Uh, we care for this boat. This is Yelta. Yelta was built at Cockatoo Dock in uh, 1949, just after the war. Cockatoo Dock, as many of you will know, particularly those from Sydney, was once the biggest workplace in Australia. During the war, there were three warships tied up here and it serviced American ships for the Pacific War. And this is our yelter in one of the docks. But there is a float. Uh, yelter, as I said, was built in 1949. It was built by apprentices. And the engine put into it was from a corvette. So it was about 40 corvettes, I think, built for the, the war. Um, they were kind of small battleship. You can't call them battleships, but anyway, they were a small fighting ship. And um, it's a seriously oversized engine. It's a triple expansion engine, which is kind of broadly of the type that was used on the Titanic, but of course very different. The thing about steam, the thing about maritime heritage, is the very long, slow transitions in change. So the first steam tug that came to South Australia was named the Adelaide, and it came here in 1945, sorry, 1845. So the port in fact, was declared a port in 1840, so quite early in our history. The first um, steamship built for the Australian trades was the SS Great Britain and it was launched in 1843. So that's a hell of a long time ago when most ships were sailed. But it wasn't until the 1890s that more cargo left Australia in steam than in sail. So a very long, slow transition. And this is really important because for us, our steam tug, Yelta, built in 1949 is at the near end of that long history and we run programs on it on the industrial revolution for high school kids and we've been doing those for about two years they're really popular there was a time when everything you know hearts mill down the road everything was powered by steam um, now it's quite rare technology but there aren't many working steam engines left of that time and so it's a rich resource for all sorts of reasons. And Yelta, although I said it was built in 1949, and it was, which maybe is not that long ago as far as ships go, it has many of the characteristics of traditional shipping. It has... It has... Um, it has riveted iron plates. It has a steam engine. It has lots of timber and brass. It has a beautiful wheelhouse which our volunteers um, polish, varnish every two months. And the great thing about this paper is that there are members of the audience in the slides, and you can pick them as we go. There's Stuart, our fleet manager, and uh, Rob Miss Sow. Uh, Both of them. <laughs> um, I found my place. 
Okay. So there are things about Yelta that drive me bananas, but um, when it goes out and there's that silent movement of a steam engine and you see how much the public enjoy and how the crew come together, it's really quite special. It all seems to make sense. But this is the part you probably know, that while steam had a long and rich history, it's pretty much all over. When we take Yelta out, we use a crew of 12. In its working life, it had a crew of four. Our crew are retired, we need 12. Um, we make a few phone calls to find out whose grandchildren have parties that weekend to see if we're free. We then spend three days warming up the engine, warming the boiler, slowly raising the pressure. And then, in a two hour cruise, we burn a thousand dollars worth of waste oil. And of course, it doesn't make sense. Flinders ports don't do that anymore. They've got these amazing tugs that can turn pretty much in a circle on their own footprint. It's way, way beyond its economic life. It's a little bit of madness. But nonetheless, we do it. We do it because there are people who are prepared to do it for us. We have these wonderful volunteers who give up their time. We have a company called Mulhern Waste Oil who give us the fuel. And we have some other sponsors who support us along the way. In fact, we had the partner, South Australian Department of Transport was a sponsor. We used to give us our survey for free. And um, I'm sure there's a member of the audience who volunteers to do that for us next year. Um, so we keep Yelta in the water. And, okay. So this is about maritime heritage and pretty much the way it's treated is defined by some of the choices you make. Some of us keep our boats working in the water, but there are other approaches. This is the SS Great Britain. It was built in 1843 and sometime, I think it was the 1970s, it was retrieved from the Falklands. It was built by Isambard Kingdom Brunel, which is one of the heroes of British industry, fantastic naval architect. It was the first ship that was completely made of iron plates, and it was the first ship with propellers. So those were revolutionary things. Um, what's special about it is that uh, it's a model for conservation of uh, vessels out of the water. Okay. The, uh, it was retrieved from the Falklands in the 1970s and it was towed into Bristol. And uh, for many years it was treated like a uh, like a second, like a ship, like a working ship. So there was rust, so they chipped and they painted. And there was more, and they chipped and they painted, and they kept coming back, and pretty soon they had their rivets sitting quite proud and not much metal in the hull. And it was pretty obvious that this couldn't go on forever. So they had some analysis done. And um, the advice they received was basically that the only way to solve the problem was to reduce humidity to zero to stop rust. Rust requires oxygen and it requires moisture. And you probably know that the American military stockpiled old hardware in their deserts, in the Arizona desert. They park airplanes and the humidity is so low that they live long life. We're probably well qualified to do that here, actually. But, uh, so this pool of water is a roof and underneath it, the humidity has been reduced to zero and this was done well, within the last 10 years, but the, apparently the measures so far are that it's working, that rust has stopped. This is what it used to look like. And with this approach, they also tried to have as little intervention as possible. So they try not to chip, and they try not to chip away original material. One of the virtues of keeping a boat out of the water is that, of course, it doesn't sink. It's done when they keep reaching up the time in their lives. But another virtue of it is that you can preserve the fabric, okay? So you've lost the function. It no longer does what a ship does. It sits in a dry dock. But they want to retain as much original fabric as possible. That's what they celebrate. And so I wish I had a photo, but when you visit the SS Great Britain, there's actually a place where there is a hull, a hole in the hull, which has been rusted through. And that is you. There is a post put through that, and that holds up the stairway. Because they did not want to drill a hole, because if you drill a hole, you lose that much of the original artifacts. And sometimes this seems like a bit of madness. And the director there, Matthew, whatever it is, it, it, it says that you, to do this, he really has to make a nuisance of himself. Because tradesmen come on board, they want to do what they know how to do. They don't want to muck around with this nonsense, you can't drill a hole, that's only a little hole. 
um, you have to be really insistent. And they have been very, very good at that. And in a way, it's kind of new to ships, but we're at the pyramids, we're at an archaeological site, we're at a building. I think people will be more ready to accept that there's a great virtue in keeping that. And that, okay. So, within that, they have nonetheless managed to install a lot inside the ship that you can see that reminds you of how it might have looked in the 19th century. This is my personal favourite. This is with the Edwin Fox. The Edwin Fox was built in 1853. Can you hear me if I talk over here? Is this microphone my collar work? No. Okay. Um, was built in, in the 1850s in, um, in India, in Calcutta. It's now in Picton, New Zealand. It's really important. It carried troops to the Crimean War. It carried emigrants to Melbourne in 1856, emigrants to New Zealand, and it carried convicts to Fremantle in 1858. It's the only surviving convict ship. And it was recovered. It was sunk. It was sitting above the mud flats that it didn't move with the tide. So it was recovered in Picton. Picton's a small town in New Zealand. It's on Queen Charlotte Sound. It's the place where you get from the South Island to the North Island. And it was recovered. And in the first year, they pumped out the mud and they pulled it ashore. In the second year, they managed to clean it up a bit more. About 10, 20 years later, they got enough money to build a shed over the top of it. And that is all they have done. And there is a shipwright employed full time on it. That's what he does. But he spends his days pretty much vacuuming. He just keeps it clean. He does very little else. You can find things that they could do. There are things that they could do to inhibit um, rust, and there are things that they could do to preserve the timber without destroying anything. But um, what they do do is pretty amazing. It's a really nice hands-off approach. And someone who's a naval architect or someone who knows about ships, you, um, it's really nice that so much of it is there. There is an exhibit that tells the general public what it might have been like on board, but that's in a separate building. And I think it's a real model. When I say it's an archaeological approach, some of you might recognise this is Port Lincoln. This is the City of Adelaide lifeboat. Um, you know the Star of Greece wrecked um, down off the Fleurio Peninsula? I think it was the 1880s. I should remember, but I'm sorry, I can't remember. Um, and in response to that, this lifeboat was paid for by a wealthy um, Adelaide citizen, Mr. Barr Smith, I think he was one of the founders of the Adelaide Steamship Company. And it was a fantastic thing that it's safe, steam powered, lifeboat, fully enclosed. Anyway, the point about it is it it's, was a shipwreck, it was recovered, registered shipwreck, it was recovered, sits at Axel Stenros Maritime Museum, it is rusting away. And um, I mean, that's a bad thing, most of us think that's a bad thing. Um, Nonetheless, um, one of my friends, whose opinion I respect deeply, is a professor of maritime archaeology, and he says, well, it's a shipwreck. It rusts. Let it rust. Don't interfere. That's the process of shipwrecks. And I don't agree with this, but um, that is a kind of very common view amongst archaeologists. That is how they manage many historic sites. So a shipwreck might have anodes attached to it, but basically it dissolves and it washes away. And um, that's at one end of the spectrum. So at one end of the spectrum, that's what archaeologists do with shipwrecks. Somewhere in between, there's the Edward Fox at Picton, where they do something to preserve it, but they don't interfere if there is no fabric. And at the other end of the spectrum, there are people who build replicas. So this is the Endeavour replica. Uh, and it came into the Inner Harbour several years ago, so again in February. And it sailed in like this. It looked fantastic. It fired a cannon, there was a puff of smoke, and it came to within about 20 metres of the wharf, and it was wonderful. There was a crowd, we were all, it was pretty special. And then it did something even more special. It turned on its side thrusters and it parked. Moved completely <laughs> sideways. There is, there is a lower deck, there is a lower deck on Her Majesty's Bark Endeavour where the 21st century lives, and I haven't seen it, but I have seen it move sideways. <coughs> Um, okay, this is a more extreme one. This is the Deutschgen. It's in WA. The Deutschgen 
um, was the first European vessel to come to Australia. We think, unless you're Spanish, if you're Spanish, you think Mr. Torres was first. Um, and uh, this replica was built like a hundred years ago. But it has just about no concessions to the 21st century. It's pretty amazing. So that is the spec. Okay. Best. This is the Jones Cave. I'm about to move on to um, vessels that are in the water. But we kind of sit in between. Um, in museums, in preserving boats. When boats work, when they carry passengers, when we take them a 1949 steam tug and we get it sometime in the 1980s, where it has been tied up for about 10 years, but really it's pretty much there. It doesn't have that much to go into it. We do do maintain it in pretty much the way that shipwrights maintain a working vessel today. So yes, we chip and rust and replace wasted metal because if we don't, it'll sink. Um, if we have an archaeological artifact like the SS Great Britain or the Edwin Fox and it's out of the water, we don't have to worry about it sinking. There's a certain freedom about how we can treat it. We have this stove, we just got it last week actually. It's from a ship called the Zanoni. The Zanoni was a three-masted bunk. It sank off Ardross and York Peninsula in okay, 1865. And, um, <coughs> and uh, um, there aren't many stoves from 19th century vessels in Australia. I, I actually think it's the only one. Anyway, the stove is pretty much turned to carbon. It's been full of chlorides for a long time and the metal has changed and there's not much iron anymore. It's like a lead pencil, it's like a biscuit. And there's a group in town who are museum conservators called Outland. And they are going to take that stove, they're going to gently take it apart and it's cracking, it's falling apart. They're going to build um, a plastic structure inside the red of the acrylic and reform the stove around it. It's full of concretion, so they'll clean that out. And we'll put it on display and it will look like um, a 19th century stove and it will give people a lot of understanding of what it was like on board ship. Obviously, that's very extreme. There's no way you're going to do that with Yelta. You are going to do that sort of thing with the Edwin Fox though. So, the reason I say this is not because this is a practical solution to the maintenance of our vessels. I'm trying to make the point that there's this great value placed on the original material, the original fabric of the object. And so a lot of what we do, even those of us who run ships in the water, is to try and maintain that. It's about what we keep. Um, many of you will know this, this is the, or all of you, this is the James Craig, so you guys met here a few years ago. Um, I don't have a picture of the James Craig. Um, on Research Bay, where it was rotting away, um, but it was recovered. You've probably possibly seen the film. It was recovered, and it was towed to Sydney, and over a period of about 30 years, it was restored. And for many of those years, not much happened, but in about two years, it was completely put together, and it looks like this. It looks fantastic. Incredible amount of work was done. <coughs> they basically took a bare hull. They might have kept three or four rows of hull plate and the keel, and rebuilt the rest on top of it. They did incredible things. They do hot riveting. Hardly anyone does hot riveting anymore. They um, rediscovered antiquated trays and their volunteers learned them. Right, okay. So, there are kind of lots of questions about the different approaches one might take. And Many a night can be spent debating them, and it's kind of a nice thing to do. But in terms of um, practical solutions, there's this really nice document called the Barcelona Charter, um, which was put together by European Maritime Museums. And the good thing about it is, kind of, they've had the debates, they've thought through the issues, and while I don't agree with everything that's in it, it's a really nice reference point for what we are trying to do with heritage vessels. And I'll, I'll go through it. It's not long. It's, um, but it does nicely set out what museums try to do. Okay, well, folks, that is the James Craig and the Church Bay. And uh, I can tell you that well, you would have seen it many years later. It was in Darling Harbour while they were working on it. And what looks like a complete hull was reduced to about two or three <coughs> rows of, um, of iron plating. So the decision to reuse it meant that a lot of that um, shipwreck was in fact lost. And there is a fantastic. Okay, come on. 
Um, not, not all of you will appear in this talk today, but many members of the audience will. I think um, you know that's Andrew McFarlane. Um, okay, the European Charter for the Conservation and Restoration of Traditional Vessels. Um, the intention in preserving and restoring traditional ships in operation is to safeguard them as works of art, as evidence of how things once were. Okay, that one I think we would all accept. It is essential for the continued survival of traditional ships in operation that they are maintained, yes. Making use of traditional ships for a socially useful purpose is a good thing. Um, most ships... There's a concept okay, in architecture called adaptive reuse. So you take an historic building, or in this case a ship, and you find a new function for it. Um, our museum is in a bond store. We don't store goods in bond, or we don't store goods before they go through customs anymore. We use it as a museum. And in doing that, we've adapted it. We've had all sorts of changes to the building, but at the same time, there are lots of things we've preserved. So that's the kind of principle that applies to reused vessels. Yelta is reused as passenger ship. Uh, the process of restoration is highly specialised. Its aim is to preserve the real, the aesthetic, the functional, the historic value. And it puts forward the, the view that in maintaining the ship, you should use materials as close to the original material as possible, and you should do it in a method that is close to the original method as possible. So you could very, very effectively use epoxy resin to plug it in the hull. It would be very cheap and it would probably work really well. But um, there is a value put forward in the craft of timber boat building and there is a value in using the original material and the craft. So we're doing two things. We're preserving the ship, but we're also preserving the trade. Okay, um, it provides for navigation equipment as you'd expect that it would, and it says that it should be integrated harmoniously, so of course it should be on board, but it should not distract from the look of the ship. Additions cannot be allowed except in so far as they do not detract from the interesting parts of the ship, its traditional setting and its balance. In all works of restoration, there should always be precise documentation in the form of analytical and critical reports. So whatever we do, we need to document what was there before and what we've changed. And it's not a big document, but it's a few simple principles. We, um, and that is why I had Andrew there, because that was traditional craft of corking, and I can't go backwards, so um, we'll move on. It's from an event we had last year, our first festival of maritime of boats, trains and planes, and we had a traditional sail maker, and uh, we also had Bill Porter, who many of you will know. Um, okay. Volunteer crews. Most of us in museums have large contingents of volunteers. Um, our museum has about 17 staff, many of them part-time, and 55 volunteers, so you can see the balance is very heavily on the side of volunteers. And they're a fantastic resource. They do all sorts of things that we could not otherwise do, and they very generously give up their time. They look after our collection, some of them help with school groups, but the largest number for us are those who crew our boats. We have about 12 to 16 who look after Yelta. They come in on Wednesdays and Fridays and maintain the tugboat. They're the crew when it goes out. And yes, many of them share the job. That was once shared by one um, young fit shipwright, but that's okay, it works. Um, and we have another crew who run Archie Badenoff, our motor launch. Okay. But in Yelta, they bring another dimension. Um, in Yelta, they bring the trades, they bring rare trades. So Yelta's a steamship. As you know, they don't make steam engineers anymore because once one could spend five, ten years working at sea in a steamship. We have two. We have two chief engineers who 
come from that background, who've worked on large ships and learned their trade at sea. Um, Stuart says he might have met another one, but basically that's it, it's all over. So what are we to do? Um, we have trained two steam engine drivers for Yalta. One of them is this man, Derek, and um, he got a boiler attendance certificate and then he was trained by our chief engineers on our vessel and he was given a, a heritage ticket which applies only to Yelka. So that's pretty much the only boat he can ever work on. But that's critical to us because that's the only way we can ever continue it. This is our other steam engine driver um, and John actually did work at sea but he had no proof, he'd lost his ticket or whatever so he did competency based training again. So it's kind of turned around for us. There was a time when we had a, a chief engineer on staff and uh, he'd done his time in the Navy. And we used to scramble around and look for master mariners to drive the boat. We had the engine room covered. Now we have Stuart Davies in the audience and Stuart's our master mariner so he can drive our boats but we scramble around and look for chief engineers. As I say, we've trained two and <coughs> that's taken us to where we are so far but really we need more and it's it's a really difficult hurdle it's very hard to find volunteers who are interested so what are the implications of all this for survey i've pointed out that what we do places a strong value on maintaining the original fabric of the ship and we place a strong value on maintaining its function particularly for yotta it's not just that it takes you up and down the river, you can do that on any number of boats, but the experience of doing it on a steamship is the thing that makes it special, is the thing we offer to our visitors. And as you well know, Australia now has um, a national system of survey, and we now have a regulation which provides for heritage vessels. That's kind of unusual. When we talk about it, and it's spoken about it, um, international meetings of maritime museums are actually quite surprised and um, they think it's um, pretty amazing. It used to be a system whereby it was fairly ad hoc. I think it's fair to say there were different practices in different states and none of them was actually codified. And the process used to go something like this. So you've got hair on the other side now, although I'm sure you had before. <laughs> the process used to go something like this. Um, a surveyor would see a heritage vessel and might suggest that there was actually weren't enough bulkheads because you'd looked at the code and here was a boat that didn't have the right number of bulkheads for its capacity and yes it was built 100 years ago but what are you going to do? And so the person who owned this antiquated steam tug would think that, not mine by the way, I wasn't that foolish to talk about my own boat, um, would think that what had to be done was he had to go and put in a new bulkhead, but that's not what the surveyor said. Um, so they would get kind of frustrated and go away and think about it and they'd meet again and they'd go through a few options. And if it went well, they'd go through a few options and eventually come up with some kind of solution. Um, and that could work. We actually um, felt that in South Australia we had a system that worked well, that we had surveyors that were willing to listen and work with us and it, it functioned well. But we also knew that none of it was written down, none of it was codified. It was just really, if the surveyor was willing to listen, make it work with you, then that was good. Um, and so we did a bit of work, I suppose, meeting with Adam and with the other vessel managers in South Australia. And we saw that there was a system in New South Wales which actually looked pretty good and that was adapted. And that became... Um, a regulation for the management of heritage vessels in South Australia, which we thought was a good model. And I didn't want to go through it line by line because I'm sure you can read it, but I think the principles that were important to it were that um, it provides for a vessel management plan. So it all begins with the vessel management plan. The vessel owner, that is the museum, writes a plan for how they're going to manage that vessel. And that includes its operations, 
it includes conservation work they're going to do to it, and it includes things like the number of passengers it's going to, um, it's going to carry. And what's important about that is that it says that somebody has to begin, they have to look at the International Shipping Code and work out how it's going to apply to that boat, and if it doesn't apply, they have to write down what they're going to do to make up the difference. It might be that you install um, life jackets, in fact you most certainly would. So there might be things that you can do to the boat that don't actually change the fabric of the boat, but put material on it. There might be practices, the way you operate it. Our tugboat no longer tows ships, that's a huge change. It no longer operates at night, it doesn't go out past the Port River. Several big management changes which are pretty much just riding down what we would do anyway. Um, and that principle of looking at management solutions as well as engineering solutions is a nice thing to have mentioned in the process right up front. The other thing is that um, there are many, many heritage vessels and some of them are mad and bad. The Murray River is the really nice hard test case, I think, because there are at least half a dozen heritage steam ships on the Murray River operated by um, not for profit groups and they are very different. There is nowhere else boats like that are really used. And um, so it doesn't make sense to take generalised um, standards and apply them to those boats. Well, without discretion, it doesn't make any sense at all. But um, the process provided for heritage vessels is that it begins with the vessel. So it begins with what is particular, what is different about that specific vessel and then it works out how it relates to universal codes. And the other is that um, the, uh, it still provides for external review. This is the document that is produced and the vessel manager puts forward what they think should be done. It is then reviewed by the surveyor. It is given to the surveyor. And the surveyor also inspects the boat every 12 months. So there's things there for safety. Anyway, when we read the regulations to those from other museums overseas, um, they think it's fantastic because they see the International uh, Shipping Code as something that they simply have to meet and there's no compromise, there's no way around it. Um, nonetheless, I would say, while it seems... Well, it turns the relationship around, it puts the emphasis on the vessel owner to begin to come up with the answers. Um, that's not the end of it, that's the beginning, that's subject to review. And in many ways, it's a harder standard because it's not just the vessel that is up for audit, it's the management of the vessel that is also up for audit. And um, so far, so good. I can't say we have yet pointed to an example of um, here's a boat which is not in survey at all and what has to happen, how can this process allow for it to come into survey? I think the Ruby at Wentworth might be one such boat, but I'm not really sure, can't speak about that yet. But for those of us who are already managing heritage vessels, it seems like a really uh, sens <coughs> sensible future. Thank you. Kevin some hate chocolate, but I'd also like a show of hands as to any surveyors that would be interested in getting in touch with Kevin to assist him and other heritage fleets in the management of their vessels into the future. I'll tell you what, if you, if, you know, as a surveyor it's interesting to do any vessel, but when you get the opportunity to see puddle line and all these other materials and other bits and pieces and steam boilers and other bits and, and things, it, it's an experience you just don't get. And, and if you are thinking about it, I'd be more than happy to put you in touch with Kevin and people in New South Wales and other places that are running similar uh, boats. Because my feeling this is it's going to be great. And it, it is already great to take the kids onto these boats and hopefully uh, they'll take their kids onto them one day. Again, thanks, Kevin. I really appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you.